child of the storm, a child of the Lord. You live your life without getting bored. You lose your mind, but you find it again. And talking about grace and talking about sin. This in the world and it's gone viral. Everybody's talking about a new revival. But when it's a question of love and survival, bourbon, bluegrass, and the Bible. going on guys I've just got done uh, cleaning the gutters out a lot of leaves on our property so cleaning gutters real fun anyways I want to make a simple video today on what is the true gospel what is the gospel if you really get deep into theology sometimes theology can somewhat be Annoying, you know, everybody uh, bickering, debating, uh, discussing, condemning over words and definitions. And sometimes in your own tradition, it could take years and years and years to even understand what your own tradition's uh, beliefs are and doctrines are. Most people don't know what their own faith actually believes. But yet... If you're Catholic, you're going to listen to certain Catholics. If you're Protestant, you're going to listen to people from your own denomination. And one of the things that gets thrown around all the time is this idea of false gospel. If you can't be Roman Catholic, Roman Catholics go to hell because they believe in a false gospel. Uh, Protestants uh, go to hell because Protestants believe in a false gospel. Luther had a false gospel. Calvin had a false gospel. The Orthodox are just Pelagian, and they work their way into heaven. They got a false gospel. Uh, you know, the Reform really didn't like Jonathan Wesley. You know why? He had a false gospel. And it really can make, so, make things so, like, confusing to where sometimes theologians can take the joy out of Christianity. Now, if you've watched this channel, you know I like studying. I, I like theology, but at the same time, we just have to be very careful when we discuss theology that we don't actually try to just weaponize uh, theology, that we're not taking scriptures and we're not just trying to be tribal to where our goal is to just bring people into our group rather than actually bring them closer to God. So... While, while so many people proclaim that all these other Christians believe in a false gospel, that really brings up the question of this, like, what is the true gospel then? What is the real gospel? Now, those of you watching this, you're, you're, you might be shocked, but I, I like to decipher between groups that have wrong teachings about um, doctrines of salvation, justifications. I think that the terminology might be uh, wrong. I think that there's maybe certain things they're not seeing. I think that there's certain scriptures they're not taking into account. But if somebody explains or defines the process of salvation different than somebody else, different than Catholicism, does that mean that they teach a false gospel, a gospel that will lead somebody to hell? Whether it's the Orthodox, the Catholics, John Calvin, Martin Luther, Jonathan Wesley, I actually don't believe that uh, these people teach a false gospel. Yes, there's going to be differences. I have a Calvin. Yes, there's going to be differences I have with Luther, differences even I have with the Orthodox or people from the Wesleyan tradition. But I don't really think that they teach a false gospel. And, and here's why. Because what is the gospel? And I believe 
that what the gospel is, is the gospel is, it's about how God saves sinners through sending his son to die for them and to bring them into a relationship with his son that therefore is saving. Picture you are Matthew, a tax collector, and you're sitting there at your post collecting taxes. Nobody likes you. You are viewed as a terrible, terrible sinner with no friends. You don't deserve any grace from God. You don't deserve salvation. You don't deserve mercy. Yet, Jesus Christ, who is the one who actually merits our justification for us, Jesus Christ walks by. And you're Matthew sitting there, lonely, depressed, sinful. And Jesus Christ walks by, and he calls you by name. He calls you, and he says, Matthew, come and follow me. To leave your post, to leave your situation behind, and to hear the call of Christ, and to enter into a relationship with Christ, and to trust in him who justifies the sinner, who justifies the ungodly, that really is the gospel. The gospel is Jesus calling people into a living relationship with him, and that is what saves that's what the gospel is. If you teach salvation through any way outside of a living relationship with Christ, then I would say that's a false gospel. If you are to say we go to heaven because we work our way into heaven, we go to heaven because we were such good people, we do so many good works, God has to save us, that's a false gospel. If you believe on the opposite spectrum, if you believe that you go to heaven because you have a thought about Jesus, because you have a belief about Jesus that is more of a thought but not a relationship with Christ, then that's a false gospel. If somebody's preaching, listen, the moment you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, you don't have to walk in a relationship with him. You don't have to turn from your sins. You don't have to leave darkness and walk with him into light. Uh, you're just saved instantaneously. That, that's a false gospel. You won't be able to, you will not be able to defend that with scripture. But if you're talking about, listen, I was a sinner and I deserve hell. But for some reason, Christ called me and he called me to walk with him and he called me and invited me into a relationship with him and I believe that Christ says that if I'm with him then I'll be saved if I'm living in a relationship with him then to be united to Christ is sufficient for our salvation and if you preach if you're Presbyterian, if you're Orthodox, if you are uh, a certain Baptist, if you're Methodist, if you're Lutheran, and you're teaching that your salvation comes from a living relationship with Christ that we have been called and allowed to enter into, even though we don't deserve it, if that's what you're teaching is the gospel, that union with Christ, that a relationship with Christ that life with Christ is what saves, it's not a false gospel. I might have differences with you as a Lutheran of how you, uh, how you explain things. I might have differences with a Reformed person on it, just how exactly does predestination work. But I don't think it's a false gospel. The Orthodox theologian, is not preaching and teaching that we work our way into heaven. 
the Orthodox Christian is teaching that we are saved by this relationship with Christ. And I will defend this to the death. This is what Catholicism teaches also. It's all about walking in a relationship with Christ. If you are living in a relationship with Christ, a true relationship with Christ, where the love of God is in you, if you're living in this relationship and you die, you will not be condemned to hell. You will be saved. If you're not living in a relationship with Christ and you die, then you will not reap the benefits of the, the merits of, in the satisfaction that Christ did for the sake of the sins of the world. It's really that easy. It, try to read the scriptures and ask yourself, does the Bible teach and preach salvation outside of a relationship with Christ? Does it, does it teach and preach salvation like it is something beyond a relationship with Christ. That's really what the true gospel is. Jesus came and died for our sins. God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son to die for sinners, to die for his enemies. That's, that's the gospel. Christ came and died to merit, to merit justification for us. And then what Christ did after he merited justification for us, Christ invites us into a relationship with him. And this is how he saves us. Now, this is where I want to try to give a, 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 a I want to try to give healing to the division. You know, there's so many divisions in Christianity. I do think that a lot of us are talking past each other. And I understand the differences. But, the big thing that we debate about is the word justification. How are we justified? What does it mean to be justified? And I want to explain four usages of the word justification. How they are used in the Bible. And how we can understand that they are theologically used. The, the term justification is not always going to be um, used in the same way. And if you understand that Catholicism is using justification, I would say, in four senses. And I want to explain this to you. And if you're a Protestant watching this, or if you're an Orthodox watching this, I think that you could hear what I'm about to say, and I think that it could make some sense to you, even if you don't agree with everything I'm going to say. So, the first thing of justification is justification is used in the Bible to describe how we enter into a state of grace from a state of wrath. Like, we were enemies with God. How do we go from being an enemy uh, with God to entering into peace with God? How do we go from a child of wrath to a child of adoption? The way we enter into this peace with God is through justification. And there is a sense where the term justification refers to that moment where you went from an enemy to a friend, from a state of wrath to a state of grace. How does this happen? How are we justified in this sense? It has nothing to do with works. It has nothing to do with merit, other than we receive the benefits of the merits of Christ that he did on the cross. We enter into the state of justification by grace alone, through faith, and this is brought to full life in baptism. I would make the argument before you go, see, oh, there you go, you had it, Nick, until you talked about baptism, and baptism saves. I would make the argument that whether you're Catholic, you're Orthodox, 
whether you're Luther or even whether you're Calvin, you're going to have this language of baptism truly being uh, what ultimately unites us to God and what ultimately uh, brings out the fulfillment of our regeneration. Even Calvin talks about this. But the whole idea is this initial justification has nothing to do with our good works, earning it, deserving it. We didn't deserve it. It was a gift. Why did God do it? Just because he loves us. That's the initial justification that is by grace through faith. Because remember, faith is the root and foundation of all justification. So all four of these usages and descriptions of the term justification I'm going to explain to you are all based on and rooted in faith. So the one is our initial justification. Entering into a state of peace from a state of wrath. This is our initial justification that is by grace through faith. Number two then, is let's look at justification as far as vindication goes. Now when you talk, when you hear um, James describing about how man is justified by his works, is James trying to prove or trying to show that true faith is proven to be true because obviously how do I know this tree had good roots well it, it bore fruit obviously the fruit doesn't have anything to do with it uh, with causing this plant to have roots but the plant has fruits because it has roots and in this aspect, the fruits of this tree are, they, they justify the tree in the sense that they vindicate that the tree truly is alive. They prove that the tree truly is alive. So can we use justification in the sense of meaning vindication? Like if you're actually living the faith, this proves that you are connected to Christ. When Paul says, you know, discern yourself to see whether you're in the body. Look in yourself. Are you bearing fruit? Are you bearing fruit? Can we can we use uh, the idea of our good works and acts of charity uh, to mean that they justify us in the sense that they vindicate, that they prove that we're saved. Not that they cause us to be in a relationship with Christ, but that they prove that we're in a relationship with Christ. And you might say, well, that, that sounds very Protestant, Nick. Well, I would argue that this is how Aquinas uses this. Aquinas does talk about a vindication usage of the term justification. So we have initial justification by faith. We have this uh, vindication sense of justification that proves and gives evidence that we are truly saved. Our fruits give evidence that we are saved. The other one, the, the third one, I would say would be our final justification. And final justification is going to be at the end. At the end when you stand before God in your resurrected body. And now every act that you have done in the body, good and bad, is presented before God. And now you are about to receive the state of your eternal glorification based on how you lived through faith. This will be your final justification. Glorification truly is the, the final sense of our justification. So many Reformed people, Catholics and Orthodox, can say this uh, state of like justification, like, I, I was justified, I'm being justified, I will be justified. I was justified. There was a time where I was not in union with Christ. I wasn't in a relationship with Christ. But he came, he called me, and he saved me. Christ came and saved me. He called me into a relationship with him. At that moment, I was justified. Now, I will be justified. I will be justified. If I die in this relationship with Christ, if I remain in Christ, then I will be justified. God will actually glorify me for all of my works. And like Augustine said, when God crowns us for our good works, 
he's crowning his own works because it's God through grace that actually does the works through us. That's our final justification. That vindication sense of justification. You can look and, and, and prove you know, to yourself that you're in a relationship with Christ because you're living in the faith. If you used to be in you know, a lifestyle of drunken orgies and now you're reading scripture, you're going to church, you're, you're not swearing, you're, you're, you're nicer, you're trying to love other people. This is a vindication that you are actually in a relationship with Christ and it actually is doing something to you. I think that three of these, that initial justification, the vindication aspect of justification, and the glorification aspect of justification, I think that uh, Protestants would actually agree with Catholics here. And they could say, yeah, I, I see all three of those aspects, all three of those usages of the term justification. I think that where the argument comes into play is in what I've called the fourth usage of the term justification by Catholics. And what this term is, is it's more tied to sanctification. It's a justification of like once you're brought into a relationship with Christ, when you are already walking with Christ, which means you're already, you know, justified in that past sense. You are at peace with God. You're a child with God. And now you are living in this life with Christ. I think that when this happens, then when we are in this relationship with Christ, if a relationship with Christ is what justifies us, entering into a relationship through faith, is if that's what justifies us, then to walk with Christ, to grow with Christ, to grow in Christ, to conform more and more to the image of Christ, Catholics would say, well, this is a sense of justification. This is this justification in the sense of like it's the healing. It's Christ's righteousness working through us, conforming us more and more to his image. And this is where most Protestants would say, well, we just call that sanctification. And I'll be honest with you, I don't care what you call it. You could call it Jumanji. I, I don't care. It's, it's the idea, though, you believe that once you unite to Christ in this relationship, when you believe that he does change you and the more and more you walk with him that one can grow in sanctification one can grow in their conforming more and more to the image and likeness of christ if you believe that and you believe this is participating in the righteousness of christ catholics just use this the term here of justification not meaning this is bringing you into a state of peace you're already in a state of peace but this is justification, a further conforming justification of those who are already children of God. But what's it all have to do with? Everything hinges on a relationship with Christ. If you are not united into a relationship with Jesus Christ, there is no initial justification. If you are not united in living in a relationship with Christ, then there will be no glorification. If you are not united in living in a relationship with Christ, then there is no sanctification. And if you're not united in living in a re relationship with Christ, then there is no vindication. You will not be vindicated. Oh, see, look, this proves that he was truly saved because he did this and that. No, you can't be proven to be saved if you're not saved. And outside of Christ, there is no salvation. Now listen, I understand there's so many differences. I get it. Ecclesiology, sacramental theology, I get it. You get into Catholic theology, you're going to see all of their ecclesiology still is based on this living relationship with Christ. Partaking of the Eucharist, you know, baptism, sacrament of confession, Christ is everywhere throughout all of that but what i just want to say not that this video all of a sudden heals the divide between orthodox catholics and protestants but it should really make you think that like 
maybe we got to watch thrown out the whole false gospel thing. Uh, and even if you watched my last video, you're like, didn't you just make a video with had a picture of Luther and it said like false gospel question mark on it? Yeah, it did have a question mark. But if you actually watch the video, I kind of say that I don't think that he had a false gospel. He just had bad terminology. And I think that Luther sometimes is maybe inconsistent. But there's a lot of great uh, language that Luther uses to show how we're saved through a relationship with Christ. And so does Calvin. And definitely so does Wesley. And so does the Catholic Church. And so does the Orthodox Church. Jesus Christ saves. God saves. Salvation is a gift. It's unmerited. Jesus calls sinners to be his friends. And he already died for you while you were his enemy. Unite with Christ. Live with Christ. Grow in Christ and you will be saved. You're going to be converting for the rest of your life. You don't, you don't walk with Christ and you, you mastered theology. It, it doesn't work like that. We're all learning. We're all trying to do what we think God wants us to do. Let's have a little bit of grace towards each other. Let's offer a little bit of mercy towards each other. And let's understand and take courage in the fact that we should all be able to agree that a relationship with Christ saves. All right, guys. Thanks for watching. Peace out.